So given that it's now about quarter to seven. Oh, so it's about starting time. It's about starting time. Hey, I didn't communicate to the rest of you, but I told him it starts on the time between 6 45 and 7 p.m. So this is like. Wow, we're early. early. Yeah. Yeah. See? <laughs> oh, we're early. By according to expectations, so. <laughs> So, uh, I know we'll have more people trickle in, but maybe we can just kind of pull together and we'll give a, we'll give a start to this. Yes, we are. No, of course you can. All right, so this is kind of intended to keep us more circular and keep the discussion lively. This is not a lecture, this is not a panel. This was just so we can record <laughs> and discuss. <laughs> so, please consider this to be an open circle and we're all, we're all going to participate. Um, so, thanks everyone for coming. Um, in particular, I want to thank Stephen for agreeing to join us to discuss his book. It's really cool for us. For, this is the fourth month, I believe, for our book club. And this is our first book, so it's a really momentous moment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we bounce around between a podcast episode, um, a, a blog post, a, a discussion on morality, and now a book. So, oh, great. Uh, yeah. and I think it's a great book. It fits really well with the group. And it, there's a lot of interesting ideas jump in there. Um, would, uh, would you like to give us perhaps a little bit of information about yourself, your background? Sure. Where you come from? Yeah. Uh, so I'm a professor at Brigham Young University in biology. By uh, What I do there is I'm an evolutionary ecologist. I study tsetse flies in Africa, uh, looking at how they move around the ecosystem. And uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, the uh, French government on research and trying to relieve this terrible fly over there. It causes sleeping sickness. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a bad, bad uh, bit of news. Uh, so that's, that's my research arm. I teach history and philosophy of biology and bioethics there, I, uh, which I love, which is a lot of fun. I, I also uh, do philosophy of science. That's perhaps my greatest love. Uh, I, I really enjoy trying to understand how science informs us about the world. And so I, uh, I've got uh, actually more publications in philosophy right now than I do in biology. So that's <laughs> maybe, maybe the philosophy department will grab me someday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so do you prefer philosophy over biology? It, it certainly is easier to sit in an armchair and think than to slog through <laughs> the uh, <laughs> soil of Africa in the heat. But yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> you do a reasonable amount of slogging there. Yeah, yeah. When I when I'm over there, it's uh, it's slog fest. <laughs> well, we're, we're we're really glad to have you here with us. Obviously, um, you know that you associate with. Uh, with all these wonderful apostles. Uh, <laughs> uh, I figure I'm like layman in the Book of Mormon. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was going to offer to water your horses and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if we can offer anyone else to marry. Oh, I tried. <laughs> Besides, the church isn't too cool. Look at right now. You are married. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the press will pass on that. So, uh, your, book, your book is a short stay in hell. Mm-hmm. Um, as I understand it, of course, uh, from everyone who's read it, and I, I know a number of us have, if not everyone here. Um, I was going to say, do you want me to do a reading from it? Or? Yeah, do you have a favorite section, or do you think there's a, a good introduction you'd like to I do. I could, oh, okay. I could read the demon part, which kind of sets up the stage. Sure. And then there's a section late in the book where uh, he's reflecting on, on hell a little bit. It's interesting. I could read that. I love that. Let, let's, let's go ahead and have a... But I don't want to cram the question. We have no particular uh, style or approach. It's kind of an open discussion format. Okay. It discussion. is the first book club, so I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I set club. the set the stage um, here for uh, exactly. further... Exactly. Follow this model. <laughs> okay, so good. So good. I better do a good job then. Huh? <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you could offer us maybe a reading and introduction to the book, we definitely kind of want to introduce the subject matter before we start diving off into... You know, remote aspects of it for anyone here who hasn't read it yet, perhaps, or didn't get to finish it in time. Okay. All right. Let me. I'll just. I'll just kind of set this. So, it it it, it begins a little obscurely, but then it it uh, uh, he, he says. Uh, so it's, it's written in the first person. He says, 
I must start with the interview or none of this will make sense. So I begin here. The proficient demon leaned back comfortably in his large high-backed red leather chair, then swung away from the five terrified guests seated before him and turned to the window behind him. The room was well lit with a long incandescent tubes arranged in several functional pairs that spanned the length of the ceiling, giving the room a soft, business-like feel. Potted plants placed tastefully here and there gave the room a sense of proportion and order. The demon was the only thing that did not seem to belong. The monster's yellow gaze was directed thoughtfully out of a large framed window that dominated the wall behind his desk. Behind the glass was disclosed a large cavern lit with, dancing red, with a dancing red glow. He sighed and scratched his leg with one of his back, black tipped hooves as he surveyed the seething molten bed of lava bubbling thickly like slowly boiling, boiling sweet candy syrup in the scene below him. Occasionally from the lake of fire, a blazing fountain would erupt violently, spackling the ceiling of the great cavern with hot lava, and then would drip in large globs slowly back to the enormous magma lake, creating high, thick splashes of bright orange liquid rock. Inside the lake, scores of wailing people could be seen, wading through the pool, screaming in agony, and even though their cries could not pierce the thickness of the glass window, the muted agony and terror visible on their faces transferred the terror of the situation to the five seated guests. All five were trembling and breathless. So he goes on describing it. Um, uh, the scene of, of, of horror, which I, I won't read the part, but he, he admits later that they're actors and they get off at five, and this is just kind of to set the, the mood for, for him. Um, uh, welcome to hell, he spread his arms out graciously. Satan, one of the women whispered hoarsely. Araman, no, 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 nothing as noble as that. I am Xandern, one of the Yatsats, as a minor functionary. I hope you're not too disappointed. You seem genuinely concerned. One of the women shook her head and turned away, sobbing. Well, let's see, what have we here today? He picked up a red triangle from his desk and began tapping on the device with a long, sharp claw of his index finger. Hmm, hmm, he repeated to himself as he gazed at the screen of his device, looking slightly puzzled. Lester Green, he said, suddenly looking up at one of the men sitting in the uncomfortable metal chairs. Rather than fear, the man seemed to radiate a quiet, bold confidence, like someone used to sending back food at a restaurant after establishing some flaw in the meal that did not meet his exacting standards. There has been a mistake, he said softly, but with firm resolve. I'm not supposed to be here. A mistake, the demon said with a baffled look on his face. Quite possibly, quite possibly. Things in hell don't always run as smoothly as one would like, do they? He picked up the red triangle and after a few taps read aloud. Let's see, Lester Green, 1294 Battle Lane, Forest City, Arkansas. Wife, Sarah Green, four children, Matthew, Mark, Jesse, and Caleb. Died while playing golf in a thunderstorm, struck by lightning. He mentioned as an aside to the other guests. Everything looks in order, the great demon said with a little impatience in his voice. No, you see, I was saved forever and for all time. I came forth at the preacher's call and was washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am saved by Christ. Who can snatch me away from God's hand? As the man spoke, he rose to his feet and drew his face upward and threw his hands into the air, crying, Help me, Jesus. The demon looked quizzically. You were a Christian then. Yes, that's what I've been trying to tell you. I shouldn't be here. I've been saved. Well, there's your problem. You didn't join the one true religion. What? I'm telling you I was a Christian. I read the Bible every day. I donated money to the TV evangelists every Sunday. I was saved. No, sorry, the true religion is Zoroastrianism. I'm afraid, but a bit of bad luck there. Christianity certainly borrowed a great deal from the one true religion, but not enough, unfortunately. Not nearly enough. Zoroastrianism? I've never heard of it. How can that be the one true religion? The man looked confused. So this sets up that he's uh, he's not um, in the right religion, and he moves through. And the last person there uh, is just still sitting there. And this is this is the protagonist of the story. Well, well, last best of all the game. Hey, Soren Johansson died of brain cancer. Mm, died young, only forty-five. Four children. Well, I'm sure they'll miss you. Looks like you were a good husband, a good father, not a bad Mormon. He smiled. You would have made a good Zoroastrian. Now what hell for you? Let's see. You like to read. In fact, it seems you love books. 
Interesting. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the demon looked up, bye, and so it began. So he wakes up in a in a in a hell. Specifically, it, it turns out that the the god of this universe really likes Borges and designed this hell based on his short story, The Library of Babel. And it, it says there's a little plaque on the wall that that gives all the new participants the the info that they've been um, uh, placed in a hell that has every possible book in the library, every possible book. So for the most part, the books are largely nonsense. So there's a book of all A's and there's a book of all B's and there's a book of half B's and half A's and there's every possible combination. But every possible book that could be written is also there. So every, uh, you know, if you need War and Peace, you just have, you know, five of these, he gets the dimensions of books, five of these volumes with blanks after that. And so, so, and, and then it says on the wall that the object of, that this hell is, is temporary. That all you have to do is find the book with your life story in it and you'll get out. There's slot there. You just find the book and, and slot. And so the, the book is really a, a, an exploration of, of um, the length of eternity. How, how you know, we, we glibly talk about time spans that stretch into eternity, but we really don't get a feel for how long that is. And so the book sort of goes through the, 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 the difficulty of this task. At the end, I also calculate the number of books in this hill. It's uh, basically a number that is too large to really grasp. Yeah, want, right? yeah. I mean, it's an accurate calculation. It's just, uh, I, this I is just, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, face, I'll face up. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I mean, you said, I believe I, uh, you said that somewhere else that, um, that you, there was actually a book that came out discussing the mathematics of this library. There you know, is. You know, based on the short story, and, and the lawyer figured that uh, lined up, right? It did. I was so happy, too, because I knew it was wrong. I thought, oh, my, there's no way this is going to be right. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's called some, something like the Mathematics of the Library of Babel. And, I, I, and it came out about six years after I wrote this, and I thought, oh, I hope. I hope I did this right. <laughs> when did I write the book then? It, this was actually written in about 2002. And so I self-published it. And then um, the, the publisher of, of Strange Violin Editions called me and said, hey, I want to publish this. This is nice. And because I saw that the uh, publication date looked like it was last year. Yeah, it was. It, was, it came, it so came out in this out edition. Tonight. Yeah, There was a Lulu edition available that was kind of an underground seller but uh, so I, I would suppose from the fact that this is based on that short story by Boyes uh, and, and such that you probably identify I'm guessing with the protagonist to, to yeah the yeah I think so I, I mean a lot of parallels to you and your identity and, and I think I think probably the way that plays out too is is when I I do write fiction I just kind of place myself there what would it be like to arrive in hell and find out everything is wrong oh my gosh I, yeah. I'm 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 uh, <laughs> I'm surprised. I thought it was tricky that, yes, your protagonist was a geologist instead of a biologist. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but I can definitely see that, the, but it was definitely that Mormon persona that I think all yeah. of us were very familiar with. Yeah. It's very identifiable. Right. And I don't think he ever really escapes from that either. He, 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 there's no rules in this hell either. Um, and so he, he he's just trying to find his way in a world without any of the values or the norms that he's used to. And, and the book is a little bit about trying to establish that. What do you do? in a situation like that. And um, I, I think the book doesn't really, I don't think you get the full horror of the place until late in the book. It doesn't seem like that bad of a, no, a beginning. No, kind of growing. I, I, I saw you kind of took a, uh, well, I saw it's kind of a logarithmic progression. Yeah. You know, like a, addressing things like, okay, first we had to talk about that first moment, and then the next day, week, and then you just, you just keep up. Uh, you know, augmenting the time scale by a factor of whatever. Yeah, yeah. Immense quantities until the end. Right. It's, it's, it's just too much to consider. Right, right. Which, which, which I like. I thought that was a nice kind of a good way to flow through. And, and since the human mind seems to think more naturally right. about a logarithmic scale, that seemed a nice flow to the storyline. For my, my things. But, but you're wrong. Uh, what, what you say, there are, there are actually a set of rules in hell, are there not? 
Kind of. Because there's a placard with uh, with nine rules. Right. Like rules hang up your towels. Yeah, I saw that. I liked that. <laughs> well, uh, and that was this weird. There was a weird mix that I thought was interesting. By the way, I'm not trying to have a dialogue here. So I'm very sorry if I'm dominating the conversation. <laughs> yeah. This, so this is a group discussion. <laughs> so jump in and uh, throw a question out. But I thought it was interesting that you had a set of uh, these nine rules or guidelines that were listed out, but. Um, but there are guidelines. They're, they're, There's no. They're, they're big stuff. I mean, yeah. Some of them are, are kind of rules and dictates, and some of them are just kind of nice little suggestions. Yeah. And, they're, and they're not really kind of. Uh, uh, they're not too hard and fast. A couple of them that I liked, you, you had several times in the book, especially in the beginning, this this kind of reminder that this is not forever. This this is a this is a temporal hell that exists for a certain amount of time, and eventually you get out and you move on. And you, and you have that here in the rules. Number two, do not get discouraged. Remember, nothing lasts forever. Someday this will be a distant memory. Or or the demon, um, if my book will turn this page, which it won't. Um, but, but the demon, you know, it said, oh, yes, uh, when he's berating the Christian, for, his, for the Christian's version of hell, and like, you know, uh, what is it? he says, um, well, you know, with a family, you were sending all the Chinese to hell when they murdered Jesus, wasn't it? What, uh, what a cruel and vicious hell it was. And your hell was not our short little correct you little hell. That was eternal damnation. <laughs> and I thought it was just a, it was such a nice little contradiction where the, in regular intervals, there was always this indication that, yeah, this might be for quite a while, but it's not forever. It's not that long, so don't worry too much about it. When, when, when very clearly, at least as, as it unfolds, it becomes apparent from the perspective of the individual. Yeah. Uh, I saw that as well when uh, you had the you had the clocks that appear at regular intervals within the, the library, and, and I saw I noticed you had digital readout that said year zero 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 seven digits, meaning it can encapsulate ten million years. <laughs> After which the clock is no longer useful, and I think at the end we, we see that that's, that's been well surpassed. Does, does the clock simply keep rolling over like a, like a yeah, car that yeah. outlasts its odometer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was just kind of wondering if, if uh, or if it changed to kind of more of an exponential uh, representation of the years. Yeah, yeah, well, actually, I thought of that first, but then I realized that it couldn't even handle that, so I just, just let, it be. let it be. Yeah. It's, it's been limited. It doesn't matter yeah. at that point. Yeah. Question about your publishing. Um, yeah. Did you read it for the Audible version? No. Uh, they had a professional guy do that. Uh, uh, Therese, my publisher, went uh, to a company that does audiobooks, and they sent us four or five readers, and we listened to him and, and picked him. I've only listened to about 10 minutes of it, though, but I've heard he's really good. <laughs> Did he have any some background? Did you even know the guy? Or? I didn't even know him. I, I have no idea who he is. I, we, we, we never directly communicated. She she worked through this company that, that did book readings. And, um, but from what I understood, he captured it. It's on my list of things to do. But <laughs> <laughs> to listen to your book. Listen to my book, yeah. I yeah, have a question about, about time. You know, yeah. Working as a biologist, um, you know, the idea of geologic time. What, were, what got you started thinking down this time? You know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question because I, I, I read Borges' story and it just stuck with me and I couldn't let it go. And I, my, my, I, I like to write. And so I, I thought, you know, well, what, what would it be like to be in that library? What are the implications of it? And as I did that, I, I started to think about how 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 big it must be! And I started trying to calculate it, and I started imagining myself with a group of people there. And at at one point, I realized this would be hell. And boom, <laughs> the, the the book came together for me at at that moment. And uh, and it really it, it was interesting when I, when I was writing it, I was there. I mean, every night I. I kind of couldn't get it out of my head. It really just stuck with me, and and it, and as I wrote, it it just was more like a real place to me that I was sort of 
channeling than it was an actual, you know, what should I do next? Everything just happened next, and I'd, I'd write it. I mean, I, I don't mean this mystically, but, but, but my involvement was at such a depth that I just kept going and going and going. That kind of leads to the other thing. I don't know if it's okay, but... Uh, no, no. Uh, I love the part where you fell in love with somebody and you just hung on to her and died and died and died. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, is that reflective of anything about you in your life? Or? Not, not specifically, except just the general feelings about love and its importance and what what makes existence tolerable? Yeah. No, I, I kind of reading through. I was wondering, given that I saw a certain degree of parallel between you and, and the protagonist, and uh, I was wondering if your wife was upset that uh, your protagonist, after death and after a time, had these things, a love affair out beyond. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she didn't say anything. <laughs> okay. maybe, maybe she's like, I get to do that too. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, she, uh, she uh, she's, she's, she liked it, but she's not given any indication okay. that she was trouble, I don't think. I just, just, uh, Something I thought was a bit interesting, I'm not sure if I should use the word contradiction or not. The oh, main character it. and some <laughs> of the other characters fairly quickly come to, you know, well, of course, Zoroastrianism is true, we're, we're here and everything, but no one ever seems to touch the book on the religion that exists on every floor. Yeah, I, and during the time I wrote, no one found it. And I think that's a bit of the irony, because there's supposed to be a specific book on every floor, but the floors are literally light years long. And, and I, 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 I sometimes actually thought about writing that in, finding the book, and I worked out the probabilities, and it was so low given the time frame that I said it would seem too gratuitous. So I, I, I left it. I left it out. That's interesting. They did not only find the book, but they decided someone came and said, "Okay, I am now the representation of that religion. I am God's servant here. Okay, now you don't need to find the book. I'm here for God or any other book. Yeah. Just listen to me. Just, just do what I say. Join this call where we can." Yeah, yeah. And and for me, that's that's kind of the way I think human nature plays out sometimes. That there's 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 people that grab positions of power, and, and nothing excluded that that here. That and for those of you who haven't read it, they spend some time trying to establish in the university and do hell studies and and. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 Myself, I was thinking through, like, okay, what, what would I do if I was there? At some point, I'm going to sit down, um, and I'm sure for the flow of the story, you had to kind of push that, put that calculation a little bit later uh, just to kind of the weight of it. Mm -hmm. but, but I figured that pretty early on, I'd have to sit down and kind of like, okay, actually calculate out all the possible books, and then try to figure out some meaning behind that number and what it would signify. But also, you know, there are interesting rules of hell. I mean, the way it exists, like, people are still... Mortal, yeah, in hell, yeah. But they're resurrected every morning. Right, right. They can <laughs> die. They can, yeah, they can. They, in, in this hell, they can die, um, but they're but they're restored. To but everything else is restored as well. Yeah, the condition of the library. So if you if you if you knock all the books off the shelves in the morning, they're back. Right. If if you left the food out, it goes away. Right. Unless you hold on to it. Unless you hold on to it. That so was like, the, I was like, that's, <laughs> that's the other thing. I start to wonder, like, what what could you craft that you could possibly keep with the limitations? What counts as even possession versus yeah. not? I start thinking, how to experiment people, but that's probably yeah. like, going beyond the nature of the. the and the, story. You, you, you remember he he had carved a bone flute, and yes. and he was so disappointed because it, it slipped out of his hand one night, and he had mm -hmm. to, he was right before the big he performance. Had it for a year. Yeah, he had it for a year, and his. And the only thing you could actually create were things based on food. food. If you could imagine eating it like a turkey leg, it would come out of the kiosk, and then you could manipulate, you could make things from that so, way. So they couldn't, know, they couldn't keep any plates or cups or bowls. Or right, or right. None of those would persist. No, I think they would, but um, if you held on to it, I think oh. the rules are such that I, I don't think there's a contradiction. 
I've, 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 I like that you calculated the odds of finding the book, though, and said that, <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> not, not on this time scale, yeah. <laughs> Did you thought, also? Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I thought about that, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just thought it was also really intriguing that just that over the rail wasn't out of bounds, essentially. Right. That That's something I honestly was not expecting. I, I just, you know, they had the whole rail, and you could see the people on the other side. I figured, oh, that's some, you know, they, they toss the food over the side. Clearly, it's some sort of out of bounds. You, you know, jump over the edge, and you wake up the next morning in the closest cot. <laughs> that, that, that was a twist I was not expecting. Oh, good. <laughs> so, I actually read the book, you know, The Library of Babel. Oh, yeah. Tricked me enough that I went off and read the short story. It's a great story. Yeah, it's a great story. And the audio version is only like 20 minutes. It's, it's, it's really short. Um, and, then, and in that scenario, the library is the universe, and the members of it are, are, are more people just living their lives. And they talk about how when you're dead, they will throw you off the side, and you will disintegrate over time as you fall through the ages. And given that you have people who fall through, fall through the library as well in your book, that while they, if they ever perish, will, will be renewed, I imagine that at some point, any, any implement that they carry with them would disintegrate through the ages of time as they fall, or any clothes or anything no, that's else. True. That's true. And, and, and how, even uh, the metal would decay yeah. uh, over the over the length of time. Because you did describe it as a, as a uh, you know, sorry, there are uh, spoilers everywhere. Uh, we expect oh, yeah, read I should have. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is fair game. Um, it, it doesn't spoil the experience of reading the book, absolutely. And I think it, even the first pages, for the director's paragraphs, you you basically right there say, "Yeah, I've been alone forever. Yeah, <laughs> eons of time have passed. We're all separated." Um, so I don't think there's any really spoilers. It's yeah, just, that's it's true. Just a story unfolding as it goes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not feeling bad about this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Just airing my my, my conscience. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, like yeah. the possibility of someone jumping over the side with a steak knife. Yeah, yeah. And, and then suddenly waking up one morning and realizing, oh. It's disintegrated. Time. Yeah, yeah, it's taken the, the, over the eons, it, it, it's disintegrated itself, and so he has to thrust himself back over to the key. Yeah, which turns out to be hard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> especially for people who are not savvy. Yeah. <laughs> that was sad. Did you, did you do any research in, in that aspect as far as human terminal velocity? Versus I, did, I, I, I looked at, at, at uh, the. The, the, the terminal velocity in the atmosphere. So. Okay, because I remember when I was reading that part, I was like, I don't know if he's actually going slow enough to do the stuff that's described here. <laughs> I, I, uh, what I've seen, a skydiver in free fall reaches about 120, between 120 and 140 miles an hour, and that's about where I w was putting their free fall in that. So um, that's kind of why it was so hard to, to get back on the floor. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, keeping in mind, of course, you know, you're going to break limbs and stuff. Just that being able to hook a limb at all, I was like, well, I'm not sure how feasible that is. He's <laughs> finally successful. You know, he's, he's paralyzed and, and dying. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he's now, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you get better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do appreciate, though, that you had the math in there. I, at one point, in the very beginning, of when he's first in the hell, when you talk about like on day two, he goes up and he pulls a book off a shelf and opens it, and you have this string of text. Do, do you by chance randomize that as well? I, <laughs> uh, no, no. I just, I, that's not truly random, but somebody who read the book actually wrote a computer program that creates these books. Oh, that's nice. And uh, <laughs> it, it was kind of cool. I thought, you know, if it would be fun to have a nice leather-bound edition of a book from the Library of Babel. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Somebody will probably do this about 400 years from now when I'm dead and <laughs> <laughs> the book's more popular. <laughs> Just a nice little about book of nonsense. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you'll have a complete library set. You can just scan through it so you can find any, uh, yeah. any random string of words that yeah. make some degree of sense. The publisher will probably put in there the, 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 the strings that they found at the university. And well, somebody used to write the book you described in there that he stumbled across. Oh, page yeah. 111. Through 222, there's a treatise on God creating the library to sort through all the possible books. Right, right. Or no, no, creating the universe uh, so that biology and evolution can sort through, sort through all the books and find, find meaningful texts. Yes, yeah. yes. That would be a fun version then. So, somebody's <laughs> write that story and produce it with all the randomness before and after. 
That's not a bad idea. I buy it. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna have to. <laughs> Did you do any calculations on the likelihood of finding those seven <laughs> intelligible strings? Yeah. And 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 I actually was probably a little generous. <laughs> but they are possible. I mean, they 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 uh, they're not. Uh, it's not far off. Those that length is within fifty years was okay. certainly possible to find. I think there was a there was a little meme I saw online that I kind of posted the other day in the Facebook event of this, this group, showing a very similar concept that you know if pi within some standardized format is represented, given that it's infinite in right, duration, right. I that, like that. That, that, that the, the characters, you know, as it, it, they would actually spell out things in large text, you know, they used to start seeing patterns, and that while most things can be gibberish, occasionally you'll have meaningful things arise that could be interpreted in, in, in interesting ways. If you've read Carl Sagan's Cosmos book, the the the, um, the novel he did, he he actually that's one of the biggest flaws of the book is he. He's, they're looking for evidence of God, and they think that if they get enough strings of pi, there'll be a message in there. And sure enough, and gazillions of gazillions of digits out there, he he puts down a pattern of this. You know, uh, a, 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 if, if you do it, it's, it's one zeros that create a circle, and and so. Um, and I don't know where Carl Sagan was going with this because he was an atheist. But um, anyway, way out there in Pi, the, the, there's there's a, a perfect circle, and and I calculated the probabilities of that circle being there at the distance, and it was way more probable than they, they should have found it a long time ago. Oh, really? yeah, yeah, I mean it was just by chance. That, yeah, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's just as 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 that the thing you sent showed any pattern. Will yeah. emerge at some point. Will emerge at some point because it's yeah. infinite. Yeah. Well, that's I think what I like yeah. about the concept of this library is that within these defined parameters, 110 pages, 40 rows, 80 characters per row, um, it's, it's a finite space, but every concept, every idea, anything that could be represented through text in some form or fashion. So I'm guessing people could look at those books and find also similar visual patterns, right. not, just, not just words and sentences. Oh, that's a good point. Sense. In fact, you should be able to find almost any picture that you could create oh, with ones and zeros oh, or yeah, twos and things in, in the book so, as well. What is, what is I hadn't thought of that, though. That'd ASCII art? Yes. Yeah. ASCII art, yeah. yeah. And, and then you could, have a, you could have a novel with a page of randomness showing an actual illustration for that that applies to the well, novel. Well, you know, you saw, I'll have a version that's a flip book. As you flip through oh. it, the little guy moves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right. There would be a book for every story that was perfectly illustrated on the facing page of that story. Yeah. Well, that's mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of mind blowing, get two irrational numbers like pi and e. Forever, they go on forever. They never repeat. Is it possible for one to contain the other? Oh, well, that's that. Yeah. 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 I had an issue with. Pi having completely random. Um, it, it, yeah. Pi may not contain the words of Shakespeare asking for one or whatever. It depends on whether the probability to figure out the moment square three, whatever, are all equal. So here, the first element would be other patterns so that if you repeat, it's never not repeating, it's sitting around. Yeah, anyway. No, yeah, I, I, I would agree it's not necessarily <laughs> true random. It's just. But, but as, as to Elvis, I mean, it's never mind. <laughs> here's, here's a mind blowing fact. This every time I think about this, it, it just fills me with awe and wonder. E raised to the pi times i, the imaginary number. So e, yeah, it's minus one. When, how can this wild transcendental number raised to the power of a wild transcendental number multiplied by an imaginary number become minus one? I can't get my head around that. <laughs> That's a crazy number. Totally I, um, when, I, when I read the book, I was, I want to say it the right way, I was just as inspired as I was disturbed. Um, what kind of a, a response have you received from people who read the book? Um, 
family, friends, or even just strangers, how, how has the book been received by um, maybe someone who isn't so much a philosopher uh, like myself? Just kind of reading this book and, I don't know, I, I find it very troubling, but at the same time very inspiring to want to do something uh, with my life now. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. There's, there's actually about 103 reviews on Goodreads. Yes, there's only only 30 something on Amazon, but on Goodreads, and most and and 95% of them are people that I I don't know, and there are kind of two reactions. One is to be really disturbed by it, that this is completely unsettling. That, that uh, uh, and they 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 say things like I keep thinking about this, I keep thinking about this. It's had that effect on me actually. I mean, I. Even though I'm the author, it's sort of when I write, things get away from me, and I'm often surprised by what characters do and say things like, "I, I didn't see that coming." Um, and 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 I think those have been both both reactions. I mean, there's there's a, a a group of people that were trying to trying to say, well, what kind of society would you form with this this sort of situation? Um, because I'm an ecologist, actually, I, I, this this is this is a framing of my view of eternity. Because for me, an endless span of doing the same thing over and over again, no matter how much fun, at some point you'd need some kind of eternal opium to keep you happy. <laughs> I think, but the way I see life unfold on Earth has has always been this wild creativity. I mean, life itself is wildly creative, creative beyond, you know, who could imagine a, a hippopotamus and a, a giraffe, and I do a lot with insects, and an ant with its cuticle and beauty. beauty. What this, what, what's emerging, though, is, is in a sense completely unpredictable, because the way that evolution works in an ecological context is that, that New ecologies create new opportunities for new emergences. So uh, there's a philosopher, French philosopher, wrote writing back in the 1920s named Henry Henry Bergson, who or Henri Bergson, um, who who talked about the creative nature of evolution, and and by itself it generates this wonderful diversity we see. It 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 it, it comes because it creates niche, it creates niches. New things emerge to, to, to take advantage of things in that niche or to resist things in that niche. Those in turn create more niches. So evolution itself, the diversity of life we see, is this wonderfully creative. We, we look around. I mean, this is this is this is life on Earth. And for me, that that's got to be any kind of system that goes on and on forever, where there are the three things that allow evolution. Uh, uh, variation, selection, and inheritance, you would get newness, you would get novelty, you would get new, new things. So this is actually kind of a takedown of that idea that any eternity, no matter how good it would be, if it's not creative, if there's not newness emerging, is, is going to be a lousy place to be in the end. And so this is, this is my sort of... Uh, so I have a sort of longer question here. Sure. Um, and it's sort of, to cut it short, I'm going to reference the Mormon stories podcast. Oh, yeah. Right. I remember the name correctly. I hope I remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> In which you talk about how a large part of it is they're searching for meaning and, mm -hmm. you know, what does all this mean in there? And my thought was, when looking at it, not only through the monotony and the lack of diversity throughout the library, but when you find a book that is completely randomized and it <coughs> describes your life, how much meaning do you really find in that of saying, this is actually about my life, rather than this is just the happenstance that somehow randomly correlates no, that's a great question. Actually, that that um, 
I, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about what would a book about my life look like. And there's an infinite number of those, and what would count? I mean, I, I'm not sure I would recognize the story completely. You know, even if it's a, per you could have the perfect account of all the events of your life. You got up, you went to the store, um, you know, just an accurate description. That really doesn't, you know, does it include that you trip walking out the door? Does that have to be there in order to count as a book of your life? And if that's true, then certainly there would be, it would take many, many, many volumes to, to write that. And that's a good question because it, it kind of shows another aspect of, of something I, I think a lot about. Um, I used to teach a class in consciousness theory in the honors department at BYU. And consciousness is such a rich idea. I mean, that, that we're conscious is complete mystery to, to science. It, it's, uh, it's, it's given that Consciousness is so strange, there is no scientific account of it, and there can't be. There's a philosopher named uh, uh, Ian McGinn, Colin McGinn, uh, and, and David Talmers uh, have written that that you know there's there's just no accounting for it. And there's a guy named Jackson. I always I always it always comes out Peter Jackson, but that's the Hobbit guy. I <laughs> can't even remember Frank Jackson. There we go, Frank Jackson. Who, who gives this thought experiment, and this is going to get to your, your, your point. Um, he says, imagine in the future there's a neurobiologist named Mary, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stipulate that she knows everything there is to know about how the brain processes the color red, everything. Okay, she's a future neuro neurobiologist. It's all been worked out. From the time the photon enters the eye to the time that it's passed to the... The, the visual cortex, how it's processed there, what happens to the, the process, what neurons it gets passed to. So there's a complete account, scientific account, of processing the color red. And, and so we're, we're going to stipulate she knows all the science, everything, everything there is to know about, about just the, 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 the experience of seeing the color red. And this is where he gets, he gets clever. He says, now, but suppose she's colorblind. And she's never seen red. She's, she, does, she has no, no, um, no sense of, of ever having known what that experience is like. And, and so he asks the question then, um, so they fix that. And for the first time, she sees the color red. And the question is, did she learn something new? So whatever experience that gave her, it had to be extra scientific, because she, by stipulation, knew all the scientific facts. And um, the other thing about that is, is you know, you, you'd have to come up to some sort of strange argument that, you know, when she first sees the color red, she said, ah, of course, there it is. That's, yeah, just like I thought, you know, which seems unlikely. It's kind of counterintuitive that she would, she would actually not say something like, wow, that's weird or beautiful or, or th there seems to be some element of that that would be, a surprise. And, and so with this sort of rich experience we have with consciousness, I started thinking about what kind of, no text seems to, no matter how hard I try to write something, it's always lacking details. And uh, there's a set, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting really obscure here, but there's, there's this guy, uh, uh, I didn't sleep very much last night, so these names aren't. Um, the set theorist, famous set theorist, talks about the size of infinities. So there's regular infinities like uh, small infinities. Uh, this name will come to me tonight in the middle of the night. I'll call everyone and tell you his name. Um, what? Cantor. Yes, thank you, Cantor. Um, so there's there's like little infinities like which are represented by the Library of Babel, you know, that you can make a map, you could map each book to a number, you could start somewhere and start making, but there's bigger infinities that are really, really big, that are sort of represented alpha nu, alpha nu, alpha nu, 
infinities. And, and there seems to be a sense that, that experience itself is an alpha infinity, that you couldn't ever write it in a language that was limited by small infinities. And now, this is, of course, really speculative. I, I, I don't want to make this as a real claim, but, um, but in essence, to your question, which I'm really, you were worried about asking a long question. <laughs> now I'm really answering, I'm giving a long answer. Um, there seems to be a sense that you can never, ever capture a life in a text in its completeness. No matter how many words you used or how much description, there are always attributes that are missing that, that if you begin to try to write in there, like my, my talking here, I, I could write down my words and then I could talk about, oh yeah, and there was ivy on the posts and oh, and the color was, let's see if I can get all the nuances of the color along this beam right here. And, and you can't capture the actual experience of consciousness in a text. And so there's a sense in which that task is impossible. That, you know, right of life has to be some subset and it can't be complete. So the demon's instructions are really actually impossible. Um, so so in, in a set of rules initially in the library, there's that, that you're here for a purpose, but uh, don't try to guess what it is because, you know, it's, it's, it's never, is that the, is that the trick of the library that your, your account is not there? You have to go through the entire thing. Yeah, and in fact, in fact, um, I've got a, a, a friend of mine points out, he said, <laughs> he said, I am not gonna. I am not gonna. I am not gonna give my authority. I, I'm not. What does he say? I'm not gonna give my sanction to the demon and their gods. He said, "I'm gonna forget it all. I'm gonna form a society, and we're gonna move forward and create a new and better one, and forget the task. We're not even gonna look for the book. It's it's too hard, impossible. So we're gonna make something unique and wonderful that will last forever, and let it let let the let the let the library play out for eternity. I like the idea, but conceptually, isn't that difficult with the parameters inside the library? <laughs> yeah, it would be. <laughs> it really would be. <laughs> because you, you described in the, in the very opening uh, paragraph, I remember, there's a, a line saying that, that by now you are all, everyone in the library is, is by far separated, right. is scattered far and wide, right. and everyone is alone. And you can and see I why from see, that ending scene. Yeah, is, is it's some sort of the diffusive form, or right. some, some you lose like, people. Are decay yeah. the population, or I don't know how you express that, but over time, eventually, just given the vastness, someone accidentally one day falls off the rail, and I'm sure it's going to happen. You know, over an e over an eternity, eventually everyone will separate from each other. I mean, yeah. you can't yeah. help but to lose a society yeah. at some point. And that's, I think, the real tragedy. Yeah. I thought about that too. Like, how can we bind everyone together? Yeah. And hold the population See, and that's what I think he was thinking: is that is there would have to be some strict rules of of boundaries, and we don't go beyond this, and it Even would be, he, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think it's impossible. I think you could slow it, perhaps, but yeah. within the bounds of a never-ending hell, uh, potentially, at least, I, I don't see how it The diffuses process. That's, that's that is actually why, it, yeah, that's the way it ends. So. I think there's a line at the end that says, you know, after a billion years, there's nothing really left to talk about. Actually, yeah. really, yeah. like that. <laughs> man, man, oh, sure, sure. sure. Hey, you said, all hope is gone, Oh, sorry. Yeah, all hope is gone. Also, all hope for anything is vanished. Meeting a person, finding a book, discovering some hidden way out. So much time has passed. What is left to say? All variety is lost. The billions of years spent searching through books has left me a poor conversationalist. I can tell you my fault, bottom, the starving and dying over and over in endless cycles of pain and forgetfulness. I can tell you of starting my search in earnest from the bottom floor, of moving slowly up light years and light years of stairs. Of opening books beyond count, I can tell you of occasionally every eon meeting a person with whom I might stay for a billion years. But what of it? After a billion years, there's nothing left to say. And you wander apart, uncaring and lonely. The hope of a human relationship no longer carries any depth or weight for me, and that all meaning has faded long ago into an, end, to an endless grave nothingness. Now the search is all that matters. I know there will come a time when I find my book, but it is far in the future, and I know without doubt that it will not be today. Anyway, yeah. Oh, that sounded so bleak. Sorry. <laughs> There's something that makes it even more bleak. What? When he realizes, gets to a point where he finds, say, three books out of a 50-volume set describing a detailed version of his life and realizes there's no way to keep hold of 50 volumes overnight. This can't be the right version. It's going to have to be something small. Yeah. Well, unless, or unless, unless that you're living is that there is no copy of the book and it's a fruitless task. Well, well that's what I, I, I 
I, oh, I thought that the ultimate despair would be to find the copy of your life. You read it. Yeah, you get to the end and there's no period. Because <laughs> 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 I was just kind of wondering about it. Yeah, and you're starting over again. <laughs> yeah. I like that your character found a, co- a, a story of his afterlife, but not his actual life. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Was, 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 was the idea that this book itself was contained in a library and he had found this book right here? And yeah. Book yeah. That's that's that was that's exactly what it was. This is this is this, he slotted this a short stay in hell. I think I think one of the things I I found most cruel about this hell in the end was was the uh, the perfect memory. Yeah. Because because I realized because you know I, I've heard a lot of people describe at different times and different places that some people really don't like the idea of living forever. It never has bothered me because I, I think I see sort of the variety and the interestingness mm-hmm. of. of Infinite possibilities. I, I, I'm not concerned by, but I know some people get really traumatized by the concept of living forever. And uh, if I was stuck in a tedious place and I wasn't allowed the the mercy of forgetting things and re re-examining them or coming to them anew, then maybe yeah. I could see their point yeah. and sort of feel that it truly was a hell. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was one of the most unforgiving parts of this this existence. I agree. <laughs> There's one point though when he's talking to um, I, I forget her name, but when he, they're talking about one of the other professors, I think, or he's, I don't remember. Um, but it's, he, there's one part where he's mistaken about it's like a, you know the Marxist. Uh, I don't I, I don't remember all the details. So did was that just a did he do that on purpose then? Like when he's like oh right that was. Never mind, sorry. Yeah, no, no. I yeah. I you just stop and consciously go back to yeah. and get it? Or is it always available for everything at first? I think I think it's always available, but that you know, even even if I remember things perfectly, I can be mistaken about implications and things. I think that's what I was I was was getting at. That you can yeah you can't bring it all up at once and you can sort of think you think something and and then remember other details that that modify that sort of that 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 kind of complexity. This might be a, kind of an elephant in the room question. Um, you the portion you read um, spoke of uh, an afterlife, and you highly identify with the protagonist, right? And where he found him, he was kind of shocked that he wasn't uh, in the true religion. The book tended to, to focus on the, um, the details of, of the intricacies of this world mm-hmm. uh, with a whole other direction. Since you identify so closely with the protagonist, um, you can choose not to answer this question, but um, probably everybody in this room thought about that, like, holy crap, what if we die? You know, yeah. Um, the way we're raised. And, and I think we have to keep that possibility in front of us. Because what I find most dis- the, the, the most disturbing kind of thinking I've seen are, are, are people who are certain. And I think it's that kind of certainty that I'm trying to subvert. Um, I, 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 I fully think that an informed faith has to recognize the possibility of being wrong, or it's not really a, an, an informed faith. The second you become certain that you're right I think is one of the most dangerous steps that 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 people take because it it, it stops you from asking questions it stops you from searching and and um, for me that's the quest in a way and if I'm wrong I want to know I I don't have any claims to, to certainty they're things that I believe and I hold to and I hope they're right I, I may wake up and be surprised. And I'm in a Zoroastrian hell. <laughs> I've been here before. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made it for you. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> 
So, so I think that's an important elephant in the room. I mean, I think I think some of, some of the, the the best comments that people have made about this is it, it is that we need to keep open some humility in all our beliefs, no matter no matter what we're we've decided to hold to and 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 what faith we cling to. If we turn that into a dogmatic certainty, I think we've, we've done a disservice to our own minds and to our own hearts, in a way. So for me, that that that's actually, I I think one of the strengths of the book when people read it is that you have to ask that question: What if I'm wrong? And explore the implications of 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 that kind of certainty. So so would you say that? Sorry, no, please. So would you say that you're an agnostic theist? Then? I'm. I'm. That's a that's a, a word I've not heard, but. Um, I've, I've, I, I don't, in the technical sense, I've heard like you can be either agnostic atheist or agnostic theist. You can be gnostic atheist and gnostic. Which is that certainty. certainty. See, I'm really, I'm really hesitant to use any labels. Right. Because for me, what, what, um, I, I have a very rich, I'd say, faith life in a sense. But it's, it's, it's actually based on experience. And I recognize the, the, the possibility that experiences can have lots of sources. Um, I've had experiences. Uh, I don't know if I should go into this, but I, now I have to because I said that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, this is this is as entertaining as it gets because I went insane once, um, completely insane, and and. I, what happened, I was doing research in Southeast Asia and I picked up a soil bacteria that burrowed into my eye, up my optic nerve and into my brain. And I went completely bonkers. I was laying in bed one night and all of a sudden the lamp exploded with green colors and it was beautiful and I thought, wow, that is so cool. <laughs> and then the, the, the room started to fill with people. Now, normally when people would come into my bedroom, I would have, like, confronted them. And so it, it's, it goes to show that, that things were shifting. But I, I, I didn't, I was, I was watching them, and they seemed like tourists. They, they, they were looking at things, and they were walking around, and they looked like they were, they were just kind of seeing museum pieces. And I, I, I was getting more and more uncomfortable, so finally I said something, okay. Uh, excuse me, you have to go away. And the second I said something, they all turned to me and said, you have just joined the great Satan Walmart conglomeration because you <laughs> talked to us. And anyway, I was, I, was, I, was, I was completely gone by this time. So I woke my wife up and told her, you know, okay, don't buy anything from Satan Walmart Corporation. <laughs> we're, we're, we're kind of in their power, but she's really concerned by this time. <laughs> so, and, um, but anyway, I was seeing, I, I, they took me to the hospital, but I was seeing things and hearing things that weren't there. I believed that my kids had all been cloned by the Satan Walmart and were roaming around the hospital being trained as assassins. And I'd meet them and talk to them. And, oh, this is fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've always been a little, but it was actually kind of terrifying. I was in, oh. you know, my head was in a raging pain. Oh. And I, was, I felt like I was being tortured. And I was I was being held captive by the Satan Walmart organization in the hospital. They they knew I knew too much. So well, I tried to laugh, but, but you're so pregnant. No, no, do do laugh because it is hilarious. Why has this not been written? <laughs> it actually has. Could a, be a bestseller. Yeah, really good. It could I, be a thriller. I, I published the, the story in, in dialogue. Actually, it's called My Madness. But the, the, the thing was, is during this this complete insanity. I never questioned the world I was presented with, which seems really weird. I mean, like right now, if a purple dragon flew by, I would go, oh no, something's really wrong. I'm, I'm losing my mind or something. But I never questioned the reality I was presented with. So not only were my visual and auditory inputs being affected, but my belief system was being affected. I mean, I took as fact this reality. And so, Anyway, my kids were trying to assassinate me. Uh, the, my clone kids. My, 
it, it's, this became a big ethical dilemma. This may be why I became interested in bioethics. It was, what, what, re, what was my responsibility to these clone kids who actually believed they had been, they, they, they had memories of, they didn't know they were clones. They had all the same memories, so they thought they were my kids. And I, I was really worried about, you know, what happens when good Timothy is placed with evil Timothy and one's an assassin and they have a dispute about records or something and one wants to assassinate the other one. But anyway, um, finally, it, I, was, I was actually dying, but they, uh, there happened to be a, uh, a doctor from the CDC retired recently and they brought him in. And they recognized this was a really rare bacteria from Asia. This happened six months after I got back from uh, my research in Vietnam. And, and so no doctor had taken any connection with Southeast mm -hmm. Asia seriously. And once that was established, they, they, they put, put me on anti some really potent antibiotics. And, and almost, uh, it's kind of funny, I saw... I saw myself go back to sanity within 45 minutes. And the reason I watched it is I had talked to all my clone kids that day and told them that they should meet me at 8 o'clock. And I knew even though they were cloned and had turned to evil, they were still fairly good kids. So <laughs> I knew they'd show up for the 8 o'clock meeting. And at 8 o'clock, they weren't there. I thought I could hear them in the hall talking. And my wife was saying, they're not coming. We don't have any clone kids. And see, there are two approaches people took. The nurses all took with. I'd say, like, at one point there were a bunch of monkeys in the room who were complaining about the slavery conditions they were under, being forced to serve us food in the hospital. And I complained to the to the nurse sort of being interested in animal rights about it. She said, "Oh, they're fine. They're just they, you know, they're well treated. Don't worry about it." I said, "Well, I'm trying to get some sleep too." Could the monkeys go away? She said, if you turn on the light off and on, they'll all go away. Oh, they work there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did. They, they hacked it completely. But my wife would say, there are no monkeys. <laughs> there are no clone kids. And I would, I would yes. That's are. interesting. From what, what your wife did, it's really what the healthcare worker should have been done. It's called normalizing. It's what you do to bring patients who are on the edge back if it's possible. Is that right? Uh -huh. When I was a CNN, they'd have us deal with the clinically insane. But those ones that are too far gone, usually you're like, "That's nice." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was. I, I, I won't go into the details. You can read the paper if, if you're interested. But I was really, I was, I was really quite, quite insane. And um, but anyway, my kids didn't show up, and so I was watching the clock, thinking. Oh, they're 15 minutes late, and this is about the second day after they'd started the antibiotic treatment. And at 8:30, I thought that it was my first. I was watching the clock, so I know the timing on this. I, at 8:30, I said, "What if Lori's right, and I don't have any in clone kids?" And by 8:45, I'd come back. I'd, I'd realized that this had all been an illusion. It, it, all the memories, though, I laid down there, are absolutely. Clear to me. I mean, yeah. I remember, I remember demons. I remember the my wife, my daughter had drawn some like stick figure paintings, and they were the leaders of the Satan Walmart. Not pictures of the leaders, the leaders, and they'd sit on the wall, <laughs> and we would argue with each other about whether you know they had a right to my clone kids. I remember these long conversations with these with Did these the demons. Mention the cause of your hallucinations or the bacteria. That came uh, the bacteria was Ber or? yeah. The bacteria was Burkholderia, Burkholderia pseudomallei, which turns out to be a, a really nasty disease that can affect any organ. And what it had done, it had created lesions in my brain, and it, and it had caused both encephalitis and meningitis. So I was really, really sick. Um, and it was it was just the brain was being squeezed under the skull due to the fluid pressure buildup and. And the and the legions were doing something. I when I when I was when I came back, I couldn't read. And one of the interns told me, you know, brains don't heal; you'll never be able to read. And, he. and <laughs> what? Yeah, I didn't believe him. I mean, I'm a biologist. I said, yeah, <laughs> it's like are you, are you whatever. 
<laughs> but, but it did cost us like, wow, you know, I'm gonna make a really bad professor if I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of critical to what I do. Um, but um, but uh, but that rewired in about a month. Yeah. So I was I was fine. Uh, so why am I telling this story? <laughs> Oh, See, the, the, I, I'm not even sure Favorite I ever came. Life. What was your question? The Agnostic theist. Oh, oh, oh yeah. right, 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 right. <laughs> so, so I recognize the possibility of, of my experiences being visually, just being my own manufacture. And so, but I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to embrace that too, too closely. And so, for me. Uh, I don't know if I should read. I've got a, my second book, a Scholar of Moab. Actually, a character discusses this idea of, of experiences with the divine as being being uh, uh, the kind of evidence that that it's not a logical argument. I mean, people like um, Daniel Dennett and and uh, Richard Dawkins want religion to kind of be a logical decision. You know, lay out the facts. Uh, but for for realities, for realities, this kind of thing, I say that I can't get to the text. I can't get to my experiences to to form logical arguments and things. And so they are experiential. And recognizing the the the, the, the weakness of, of of that, but the reality of it for me makes me really hesitant to to sort of claim any kind of label to this. It's it's for me just. Um, a emergent property and experience that I, I don't think I'll have easy answers for in my whole life, but living in the experience to some degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Exactly. You describe your character. Um, you know, he is that. Great, it seems like his brain has been. It's not. It's no longer. I think therefore I am. It's I think I'm hell. Therefore I am in hell. Yeah. 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 That, that he is compelled to believe it just because it's just so overwhelming. The experience. Yeah. And the feeling. And, sense and there's and there's no way to get away from that experience. Yeah. And and um, and uh, in in my other book, there's uh, some a, a set of conjoined twins, and one is an atheist and one's uh, a believer, and he's the 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 voice is the is the the atheist conjoined twin, and he's. He's talking about his brother. He said, I've never understood him. I've, I've never been able to get him to give me any arguments. And he says, but you don't understand. My, my, my faith is based on experience, not on, on logical. They're both Oxford-educated, conjoined twin cowboys living in Moab. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, and I'm disturbed by it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a rather disturbing revelation that I, I'm so uh, muddled. But um, yeah, and 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 for me, this this points to the I think the the most important fact of life is its openness to reinterpretation, to, to, to re-exploration, and things like that. This is why I'm hesitant to lock down any label for myself. So I, you mentioned uh, the reviews and how many of, many people were disturbed. How many were disturbed by the, the that initial religion thing was always wrong, or, or who were more of them just the, the dismal? I, I, I was pretty. Uh, there was actually a, a fair number of both. Um, uh, s s some and and it actually shows up like. Uh, uh, people who were really, really disturbed, saying, "This is, you know, blasphemous." Kind of, you would give it two stars and say, "This, this is disturbing." And and there's there's uh, there's one guy who 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 it, it's it's funny watching him. He he gave, he gave me two stars and said, "This was just completely disturbing." And he came back six months later and, and says, I thought of more reasons why this is disturbing. <laughs> and he came back a year later and he said, and there, here's some more reasons why this is disturbing. And I thought, 
that's nice. Gee whiz, you ought to give me more stars if it's making you think this hard about it. I know. <laughs> if you can't let it go, then this needs to be, you know, you need to up this a little bit. <laughs> Obviously, it's a good book if you can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. So, he was, uh, so, so like, good. oh, all so, so so right. I I was just, I was going to ask, so in Mormon culture, at least in my experience, a lot of times you hear the phrase, I know, when people talk about their beliefs. Does, do you find that troubling in Mormon culture? In some ways and in not, not in other ways. Because for me, um, I recognize sort of what kind of uh, epistemic stance they're taking with that. Um, I... I I don't think they mean beyond a shadow of a doubt. In fact, I remember as a missionary, one of the, Von J. Featherstone was there, and he said, I hate when people say beyond a shadow of a doubt. He said, all I have to do is stand up and say, it's all not true, and they'll all have all kinds of doubts. I thought, that was really weird. I thought that was a really weird thing for him to say, but, um, and so, so from the perspective of, of common, uh, you know, a lot of times people want to say that for some kind of human certainty where where you really, you know and you can't doubt anymore, which I don't think is even possible. I mean, you know, I may be never recovered from this insanity that I have and I'm in a rec room now talking to a, a group of nurses and think I'm just an author who's bringing the tranquilizers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a group of stuffed animals there, and I'm expounding to them. Well, do you know that I belong to the Corporation of Walmart? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's the other to evaluate yeah. your, your performance. Yeah. Cool. yeah. I, I really hope that's not true because where does that leave us? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Don't stop thinking. Yeah. My existence is at stake here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Your book, kind of like, who said that? Like, you know what? Never mind. This is all like crazy. This is. It's all my head. I am it's somewhere else, and you're all figment. You're all you're all being generated in some fashion. And everyone's kind of like, "Well, we can't argue with you, but I know that I'm real." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 move on. <laughs> well done. <laughs> no, no. So, so you had a another little item in here that I thought was kind of uh, applicable, very applicable to this particular group of people. Um, you talk about how after a little bit of time, you know, he's finding himself you know, becoming romantically involved with with someone. But he still feels this connection to his past life, and he's not sure. But then again, the entire foundation of what he considered his moral structure has been kind of shaken and yeah. like broken apart. Yeah. Uh, so I, it says, um, "All my life, I have lived with a strong sense of morality. How do you give it up? How do you do things you thought you'd never do? Where do all the things uh, you believed go when all the supporting structure is found to be a myth? How do you know how or on what to take a moral stand?" How do you behave when it turns out there are no cosmic rules, no categorical imperatives? And that need to redefine, that seems to be something that, that for this group in particular, we've kind of experienced you know, mm -hmm. outside of hell. Yeah. <laughs> Although maybe there's some hell aspects to that for some people. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that kind of applies more broadly. Like you're talking about where there's that element of, of needing to allow yeah. for, a, at least, a, at least a mile, an iota of doubt. We all kind of have to deal with that. It's not just something. Right, and, and I, I think that's actually almost a, a human universal for anyone who's, who's, who takes their faith seriously enough to, to mature in it. I mean, um, to me, to me, there, are, there, no matter where you stand, there are things that you realize have to be set aside and embraced as you grow, as you mature, and as you as you move forward in life. And so, um, you know, there's, there's uh, a different responses to that. And, and I think that, that they're all, in a sense, legitimate. They're, there's just difficulties that have to be faced. And so the, you know, the faith of my missionary years is much different than my faith now. It's, it's, um, it's it's a lot of things had to be given up and a lot of things had to be embraced that are very different to that person. But um, it, in my experience, that any religious belief system, it's in it's against the rules to question because you're questioning the very foundation of whatever mm -hmm. religion it is. So 
it seems like kind of a See, and it, for me, for me, um, discovery thing. Yeah, that's that's not the kind of thing I think that's good for religion. Actually, I think that probably religions that that uh, don't question or get stagnant. Um, you guys probably didn't listen to conference. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> we oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll still keep up with it. Oh, okay, perhaps we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a. Uh, 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 Jeffrey R. Holland talk where he introduces the idea that doubt's an important part of, of faith. And I think that's actually an essential part. And, and uh, there's a theologian named Paul Tillich that plays a lot about this. So religions that, that say don't question, I think are immature and eventually have to, have to give up that kind of... But, but don't they all... No, I no. Mean, don't uh, question. Just hearing. No, I faith. think. I mean, I I just came from exactly. England and I I attended Even Song uh, several times at the uh, uh, Anglican Church, and uh, both of their their talks were were open ended about about questioning that 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 I think I think a, a mature faith recognizes. Okay. Questions are never inappropriate as long as you're seeking. Do you think they're maturing? I do. Out of they, they have to. I do. I, I actually do. I think. I think. And then I think that that's that's why I was I was bringing up Jeffrey Holland's talk. I thought it was very mature talk to a more mature audience than than say the the kind of talk you would have gotten in the fifties. Uh, so for me. I, th I think that that kind of thing is is vital to to growth. I mean, I even I remember hearing phrases like, I can't remember the exact, but like faith and doubt cannot exist in this, at the same time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think you kind of both messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of to different degrees at different times. Right. It seems to be a fluctuation. There, this, there exists even within the organizations a degree of variation and selection. Right, time. right, right. Like. Like I was just reading Joseph Fielding Smith saying, evolution is of Satan. Yeah. My whole Sorry. career is just <laughs> <laughs> going down the tube. Right? Well, on the Mormon Stories podcast, they identified me as violating two of the... Uh, Seven uh, deadly heresies. The, yeah, the, the, the deadly heresies. Yeah, yeah. You, say, you say that God is, uh, is able to uh, experience new and... and yeah, uh, yeah. Evolution yeah. is real. The evolution How is real. I know. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, as, as no seeing the time, and we're, we're getting a little past okay. Time, so we're gonna we're gonna start to kind of uh, wrap this up, I think, okay. a little bit, at least in the formal sense, and then we'll we'll, we'll slowly kind of mingle and talk and dissipate as we do. Uh, you, you mentioned that you had a couple of different uh, sections. Uh, is that other uh, selection of the book? Do you perhaps want to share that? Oh, I should, I could. Yeah, this is not quite as long as the other one. Um, it's actually um, a scene where he's been in hell a long time. And he's, uh, he's, 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 he wants to find another section of hell that has some variety in it and says, I dared wonder if I might have come to a new part of the library. Perhaps this was where the Chinese were kept. Maybe I could meet an Arab from the 15th century. But I knew deep down that it was not to be. The books were full of Roman letters, I reminded myself. But maybe I would find someone from Germany. But then there are no umlauts, 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 from England maybe. But somehow I feared the defining point of this hell was its unrelenting uniformity, its lack of variation from type. If there was a heaven at the end of this, it must be filled with great heterogeneity, perhaps a multiplicity of intelligent species spread across the universe. Yes, heaven would be as full of difference as hell was of homogeneity. I thought of the mountains and the forest I remembered from my life as I climbed. I thought about the intricate structure of an ant's cuticle, how delicate the song of a bird nestled in the twisted branches of a towering pine, sounds spilled into the cool morning. I thought of the zippered feathers of a sparrow and of its patterned colors, the banded molting of its breast, its tiny feet curled around the rough brown bark, cracked and furrowed, giving purchase to those tiny clawed feet. What I would have given even to see a cockroach in this place. 
It would be heralded as a treasure that could be not be purchased with the king's ransom. To see six legs splaying from its thorax would have been a sight worth waiting in line a thousand years long. Songs would be written about its delicate, multi-segmented antennae. Its wings would have inspired such poetry as to make people weep for decades at its telling. But here, deep in hell, there was nothing to match such a wonder. Such splashes of, unif of multi Deformity were denied us. Our attempts at music were nothing but a shadow of that which we enjoyed on earth. And even more than music, we missed the natural sounds, the sound of wind through the yellowing leaves of an oak on a cool day late in fall, the sound of water splashing over smooth stone and a tiny creek as it made its way down a steep mountain. Even the sound of a train whistle or the sound of a truck screaming down the highway would have seemed like a symphony. So... That was the monotony. So I guess what I kind of want to call it in this moment is, is the final the big question, as I see it. You find yourself that you're in the, in the room with the demon, and you're given a choice. <laughs> Annihilation or this hell? <laughs> Where do you go? <laughs> oh, dear. I, I'd be really tempted by annihilation. Yeah, <laughs> I really would. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's going to be my choice now, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll find yourself there and you'll say, okay, I was really inspired by the book. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. Here's your hell. Here's your hell. <laughs> do you or do you, you take or the or door or between? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I, I Just carry a coin with you on them. That'll make it easy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Let's, let's do this <laughs> right. <laughs> right, David. Um, I was just interested real quick that the, the book your story was based on, the library that traveled, uh -huh. um, was, the, was that story kind of portraying to everyone on the hell? No, actually, actually, he just sort of imagined a whole universe made like this. Oh. And so, in his original story, it's it's kind of like in hexagons. It doesn't. It's not in the in the rows, and and people are sort of born into it and and die. So it, it was it was the possibility that people didn't live forever. They just kind of cease to exist. And so when you're the I'm sorry, I didn't read it. Oh, yeah. Did you even talk about that at all? Or just something that went to heaven? Yeah, no, this in this one, actually, a whole bunch of different hells are kind of implied because the demon, when he's when he's got everybody in front of him, he sends a, a bee biologist to, he says something like, oh, you like bees? Well, I've got a good hell for you. And he sends her there. And then the Christian, you, he, he, he's got this impish look, and I really hate to think where he got sent. <laughs> but, um, but, but everybody kind of went to their went to their own. Was the idea then that everybody would go to us? Yeah, yeah, if you weren't Zoroastrian. Oh, okay. If you're Zoroastrian, you, you, got, you got So my question was, were all of them temporary hells or just some of them? All of them were temporary. Well, so to speak. I so mean, to speak. When you go on for eons <laughs> and eons. It's temporary. Eons, <laughs> the, 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 there comes a point where The title's where like, a little ironic. So. <laughs> it really is. It, the false hope adds a whole yeah. new layer that's yeah. kind of like hilarious. It reminded me kind of too of Yeah, yeah. Before the law. There's a gatekeeper before the law. I don't think I've read that one. But no. Uh, so should I? Where really, there's kind of the idea that there's um, the gatekeeper kind of the idea is toward heaven, I think. Mm -hmm. Again, with the range of different versions, but um, just that the, the law is attainable to everyone. Oh, that's an interesting yeah. idea. Take over and test right. is that you need to demand it yourself. My idea of you leaving church long, for long, the longest time really has been that too. Like that idea that's kind of unjust for like the Japanese person who lived a good life. Right. You know, to, um, but it would be demanded that you know, it's like a, it's more of your.
bureaucracy to say you have to wait until it's not accepted. The more, you know, yeah. you are what you are, and having the ease and space to simulate because everyone just, you don't just change, it seems magical to change a person, but having that held in perspective in a way, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's an interesting idea. Like, like it would be interesting for him to just take a pair of scissors and cut out the letters that defined his life and then slot it and say, here it is. I I'd wondered that myself. <laughs> yes, like, yeah. it, I had wondered when they did the university, did any of them even try to write their own books? Yeah. Even though when they... No, they, they missed that. I mean, they didn't have you to... Get the proper materials, <laughs> make paper, make yeah. book, and slide it yeah. Yeah. Oh, gee, that, just take a turkey leg or something and start scraping on an yeah. existing book. It's all your art cut up. So you write your own. <laughs> food. I like that. Yeah. Rip, rip it off, <laughs> lick it, stick it <laughs> on there. So, uh, just uh, you know, wrapping up, I want to thank you again for, for joining us. It's been a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate um, you reading my book. That, that means the world to me. Oh, I, I think, I think it, was, it was a very interesting story, full of, of wonderful ideas to explore. So we want to kind of give you uh, some token of appreciation of this pin. This is kind of our group uh, insignia our logo. It is uh, the apple with a bite out of it. And if you see this, the silhouette of the king. Oh, I like so, it. <laughs> and, and tasting of the... Oh, of that's the really cool. I really like that. So we, oh, figured, thank you. we figured that's, that's a, a beautiful symbol, whether you're post-Mormon, Mormon, or, or anything else. Right, right. Well, so, thank you. So, I appreciate you. Thank you again. Thank you for inviting me for this. I appreciate it a lot. So. It's talking into an ear. I brought I brought some with me if anybody wants to buy one too. So, and this is my other book that you might like that just came out. It's all in my This one's. This one. Yeah. This is this is the the conjoined twins. It's about a, a a kid in Moab who wants to become a scholar, but he's rather deceptive and. Well, you have to. It's it's hard to make this book sound good. <laughs> <laughs> well, the conjoined twins with the atheist, the yes, and that was kind of a nice look. Yeah, yeah, it really yeah. kind of is. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't they're work awesome with every everybody. And yeah, they're Moab. yeah they, they're cowboying in Moab because they failed oh, their they failed they failed their uh, thesis defense. They suspect because they are conjoined twins, and Oxford was a little embarrassed. Okay. So. Well, I'm interested, so I'll, I'll but the but the but the uh, the other character's a poet <laughs> that lives down there that people think is insane because she thinks she was abducted by aliens, but she's actually the only true voice in the book. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming.